All right. Uh, we can get started whenever you're ready, guys. Shall we? Shall we begin? All right. Okay. So my name's Jimmy. Uh, I'm fourth year med. For those of you who don't know, um, a bit about me. I'm currently doing psych at Easton. Uh, I've recently returned from exchange in Sweden, doing my peds obsgyn at Karolinska. And next year, I'm hoping to do a BMED Sci in hematological malignancies. So preparing for that, uh, well, pre preparing for this has been really good revision for me. So hopefully I can translate that onto you guys. So starting with my outline, the way I like to approach the different specialties in medicine is to break them up into groups uh, for the conditions. So in hematology, you can break the conditions up into anemias, bleeding disorders, heme cancers and proliferative disorders, and bone marrow failure disorders. And likewise, in endocrinology, you can break it up based on the endocrine organs. So pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, adrenals, pancreas, electrolytes, and then we can do uh, gonads, that's more of next year. Um, and a bit about my uh, presentation style. I do like to ask a lot of questions, but usually I just answer those questions by myself. So rest assured, I'm not gonna pick on anyone. Um, but if you uh, want to challenge, see if you can try to answer the question before I answer it. So either think it to yourself, mumble it to someone, mumble it to yourself. Um, that can be a challenge. So let's get started and I hope you enjoyed the lecture. So starting with haematology, uh, getting started on anemias. And so these are the conditions that we'll go through. Uh, let's start by defining anemia. So anemia is low hemoglobin. That's all there is to it. Uh, there are different values. Uh, based on whether you're a male, female, pregnant, neonate. And if you've got low hemoglobin, hemoglobin is that metalloprotein that carries oxygen around the blood. So low hemoglobin means symptoms of low oxygen, hypoxia. So fatigue, shortness of breath, pallor, headache. And then as it gets more severe, uh, you can get symptoms like angina from the myocardium being starved of oxygen, reactive sinus tachycardia, and that's more related to lower hematocrit, uh, less thick blood, and then you can get flow murmur. And so we can break up the different types of anemia based on the size of the red blood cells. So we have microcytic, macrocytic, and normocytic. And I like to use the ranges of 80 to 100 rather than say 79 to 98 or whatever it is, just because it's easy to remember. So less than 80 is microcytic, greater than 100 is macrocytic, and in between is normocytic. So looking at the structure of hemoglobin itself, so hemoglobin, heme plus globin, and heme is composed of iron plus protoporphyrin. So these are our three components of hemoglobin. And if you're deficient in any of these three, that's how you get microcytic anemia. Macrocytic anemia is low hemoglobin due to an issue with the red blood cell uh, divisions. And then normocytic anemia is due to either a hemolytic or a production issue. So let's get straight into the mnemonics, the good stuff. So to remember microcytic anemia causes, it's TAILS. To remember macrocytic anemia causes, it's A, B, C, D, E, F. And then under normocytic, we can divide it into high reticulocyte count, that's pH gas, and low reticulocyte count, that's Mr. Calm. So let's start with microcytic anemia, TAILS. We have thalassemia, anemia of chronic disease, iron deficiency anemia, lead poisoning, and cytoblastic anemia. Remember those components of hemoglobin? So if we're lacking iron, it'll be anemia of chronic disease or iron deficiency anemia, an issue with the globin, that's thalassemia, or an issue with the protoporphyrin, that's lead poisoning or cytoblastic anemia. All right, so let's start with thalassemia. Thalassemia, as I said, it's an issue with the globin, so decreased synthesis of alpha or beta globin. So let's look at the structure of globin. So all hemoglobin has four globin chains. Two are always alpha. So if we have two alpha and two beta, that's hemoglobin A. Two alpha and two delta, that's hemoglobin A2. Two alpha and two gamma, that's hemoglobin F. And then uh, as to what contributes to those, two alleles contribute to beta, whilst four alleles contribute to alpha. So depending on how many allele defects you have, that will uh, reflect the extent of the symptoms. So if you've got one defect in alpha, say, that's usually asymptomatic, maybe a slight anemia with a slightly decreased MCV, otherwise asymptomatic. 
two defects, mild anemia, three defects, this is where it's really severe, uh, requiring frequent transfusions, and you get this beta tetramer. So the betas, beta globin, start forming together to make foursomes rather than two alpha and two beta. And that's called hemoglobin H. And then four defects is death in utero, uh, hydrops fatalis. And you get the, instead of the two alphas and two gammas in hemoglobin F, four gammas start forming together, making tetramers. And that's called hemoglobin Barts. And that's like entirely, entirely academic. If you find hemoglobin Barts, the fetus isn't going to be alive. So beta thal, one defect, asymptomatic, just like with alpha thal, and then two defects, severe. So looking at uh, epidemiology, you can remember alpha thal, Asia, beta thal, Mediterranean, uh, but there's a massive crossover there, A for A. Looking at the investigations, uh, you've got a microcytic anemia. On the blood film, we have teardrop cells, target cells, and basophilic stippling. So does basophilic stippling mean that something is wrong with the basophils? No. So let me show you. Uh, so these are teardrop cells. This is a target cell. Teardrop cells. And this is basophilic stippling. So stippling means polka dot pattern, and basophilic means dark. So uh, you've kind of got dark polka dots scattered around the uh, red blood cells. That's what basophilic stippling is. Um, the diagnostic test of choice for thalassemia, hemoglobin electrophoresis. And as I said, the management, uh, if it's severe, regular blood transfusions, and often they require so many that they actually develop iron overload, and you need to treat that with iron chelation, desferioxamine. So let's go to the A entails, anemia of chronic disease. This is a microcytic anemia associated with chronic, chronic inflammatory state or cancer. So the classic question involving this is a patient with a rheumatoid arthritis. And the pathophysiology behind this is actually really cool. So the body struggles to, dis to differentiate between chronic inflammation and bacterial infection. So what the body does in either of these states is hide iron away as its storage form ferritin because it thinks bacteria are around. And so this is a defense mechanism. Uh, and thus, with anemia of chronic disease, you get a low serum iron and a high ferritin. So full blood count, microcytic anemia, iron studies, low serum iron, high ferritin. So I think this is a good opportunity to go through iron studies. There are four different components, serum iron, transferrin, so iron's carrier protein, uh, ferritin, iron's storage form, and transferrin saturation. I find the easiest two to remember are serum iron and ferritin. So it's iron and it's storage form. So I think, uh, just on first principles, if you've got iron deficiency, you're going to have low serum iron and you're going to have low storage iron, low ferritin. Whereas if you have iron overload, say hemochromatosis, you're going to have high serum iron and high stored iron, high ferritin. Um, anemia of chronic disease, as we've just said, iron is being stored away as its storage form ferritin because uh, the body thinks it's a bacterial infection. Uh, and so we have a low iron and a high ferritin. So those are the two ones that I remember. And then as for this transferrin and transferrin saturation, as you can see, transferrin saturation, the values of lows and highs, are actually the same as with serum iron. So I just remember that, no problem. And then with transferrin, rather than think through this uh, based on first principles, I kind of just look at ferritin and see it's backwards. The lows and highs are backwards. And just like that, I've got them all down. And that's how you can easily remember them. Um, so moving on to the eye entails, iron deficiency anemia. So microcytic anemia due to iron deficiency. So let's look at the etiology. So the primary one is blood loss due to heavy menstrual bleeding in women and GI bleeding. And GI bleeding is one that you can't forget. So like peptic ulcer disease, varices, Mallory Weiss tears, diverticular disease. So let's say, let's say there's a 70 year old patient, comes to ED, they're fatigued, pallor, they're deteriorating, and you check their hemoglobin and it's like 55, dropped from two weeks ago when it was 100. In that case, what is the first investigation that you've got to do? It's not an iron study, it's a gastroscopy. 
You've got to assume they're bleeding, go for the, assume the worst, and do a, send them straight to gastroscopy. Um, so another one that you can't forget is celiac disease as a cause of iron deficiency. Where is iron reabsorbed in the GRT? Duodenum. Duodenum is iron. Uh, and vegan diet. Don't forget that one. Signs and symptoms. Pika. So that's, we all know about pika, craving for non-food items like dirt, paint, clay. And if you have pika for ice, that's called pagophagia. And that's specific for iron deficiency anemia. Kind of cool. You get nail changes like colonicia, hair loss, glossitis, angiostobotitis. We have a microcytic anemia. And we have high platelets. And this is quite unique to iron deficiency anemia. For someone with microcytic anemia who has high platelets, iron deficiency anemia should be at the top of your list. And on blood film, we have these microcytic red blood cells. What is this? It's a neutrophil. These are our small red blood cells compared to the neutrophil. And they have these pale centers. That's called hypochromia. Um, and management, give them iron, whether that's oral or IV. That's iron deficiency anemia. So now, yeah. Uh, and unless you have like a height index of suspicion for thalassemia, um, I think in a lot of patients you can just, you can kind of guess that it's probably iron deficiency. Um, so like, um, for example, uh, let's say there's a question, there's a maybe like 25 year old woman um, and she's uh, no symptoms, low, she's got anemia, low MCV. Uh, and let's say the GP might just assume that she's iron deficient and puts her on iron. So sometimes that happens. Um, the question might be, she comes back, uh, MCV, uh, anemia hasn't changed, and that's where you've got to be thinking, maybe she's like alpha thal or beta thal minor. So no symptoms, and she's got the, that low MCV anemia. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you, if you think it could be thalassemia, yeah, you can do the electrophoresis. Good one. So cytoblastic anemia. Um, this is, uh, so why have I skipped lead poisoning uh, in the tails mnemonic? Lead poisoning is actually a cause of cytoblastic anemia. So it's kind of a cop out from a mnemonic's point of view. Uh, so cytoblastic anemia is microcytic anemia due to defective protoporphyrin synthesis. Let's look at this composition of hemoglobin again. Hemoglobin equals iron plus protoporphyrin plus globin. So iron and protoporphyrin combine together to make heme in the mitochondria. Uh, the way they do this is that iron comes into the cell, comes into the mitochondria, binds to protoporphyrin, and then the two leave together. Uh, iron can get into the mitochondria, but it can't get out on its own. It can't get out without binding to protoporphyrin. Now, protoporphyrin... Uh, Defective protoporphyrin synthesis can be congenital, so ALAS enzyme mutation, or it can be acquired, so alcoholism, lead poisoning, B6 deficiency. These all affect the enzyme or the production pathway for producing protoporphyrin. And so, as I said, if there's no protoporphyrin, iron goes into the mitochondria, can't get out, and so you get this buildup of iron in the mitochondria. And so you develop these iron-laden mitochondria that form a ring around the nucleus of erythroblasts. And that produce what are known as ringed cytoblasts. And so if you do a Prussian blue or a pearl stain, you can see these ringed cytoblasts. This is the nuclei, nucleus, and this is the, uh, the iron-laden mitochondria. Uh, what other condition do you do a pearl or Prussian blue stain? Hemochromatosis. And Essentially, uh, cytoblastic anemia is a buildup of all this iron. So as far as iron studies are concerned, it's the same findings as in hemochromatosis for cytoblastic anemia. All right, so that's microcytic done. Let's do macrocytic, A, B, C, D, E, F. The most important ones to know are B12 and folate deficiency and endocrine, hypothyroidism. So... The reason why hypothyroidism is a cause of macrocytic anemia is because thyroxin is important for the division of red blood cells. Um, and with each division of a red blood cell, they actually get smaller. 
So this is what macrocytic anemia is. They fail to divide that extra time. So they're too big. And, that's, uh, and that often is associated with less hemoglobin inside them. Uh, and so that's why hypothyroidism, low thyroxin, will give you this macrocytic anemia. So as for B12 and folate deficiency, let's go through them now. So macrocytic anemia due to B12 or folate deficiency. Let's do B12 first. So what's the process of B12 absorption into the body? So first, you consume the B12. It goes into the stomach. It binds to intrinsic factor produced by parietal cells. And then the two ride all the way down, to the, G down the GRT into the terminal ileum where they're both absorbed together. So what can give you B12 deficiency? You can have inadequate intake, for example, vegan and vegetarian diets. You can have lack of intrinsic factor or lack of parietal cells, uh, so pernicious anemia, autoimmune gastritis. You can have no stomach, so that's gastrectomy. Or you can have a damaged terminal ileum, and that occurs in Crohn's disease. What about how do you get folate deficiency? Folate deficiency is actually really, really common, especially in alcoholics. Uh, where is folate absorbed in the body? It's jejunum, primarily. Uh, you can get it from this tea and toast diet, inadequate intake that way. And then there's also pregnancy, because the fetus needs folate to develop. Uh, and drugs, like methotrexate, antifolate drug, phenytoin, trimethoprim. Signs and symptoms, in addition to your typical symptoms of anemia, like pallor, fatigue, B12 deficiency can also give you paresthesias, and that's specific for B12 deficiency. Be, look, be on the lookout for that one in exam questions. And uh, the reason why it causes paresthesia is because B12 deficiency can cause subacute combined spinal cord degeneration. Uh, it's involved in converting a toxic substance to a non-toxic one in the spinal cord. I don't actually know uh, too much about that, so I'm not going to pretend to, but all you need to know is that B12 deficiency can give you paresthesias from damage to the spinal cord. Investigations, full blood count will give you a macrocytic anemia, and on the blood film, it's called megaloblastic with hypersegmented neutrophils. This is our neutrophil, and it has heaps and heaps of segments. You can also do an autoantibody screen for antiparietal and anti-intrinsic factor antibodies for pernicious anemia. And as for management, uh, they need to reverse that deficiency, either with diet change or supplements. Intramuscular hydroxycobalamin, it's intramuscular B12, or folate supplementation. All right, that's all we need to do for macrocytic. Now let's do normocytic. This is the more tricky one. We've kind of flown through the other two. So uh, there's two types of normocytic anemia. There's high reticular site count and low reticular site count. So high reticular site count normocytic anemia is due to hemolytic issues. So if you've got hemolysis of red blood cells, then the body is going to respond by trying to produce more red blood cells, get that EPO erythropoietin up, produce more red blood cells, and so you'll get an influx of these immature red blood cells, these reticular sites. So you can remember high hemolytic, H for H. And then... Sorry, yeah, go for it. And then low reticular site count, normocytic anemia, it's a production issue. So uh, if you're not producing red blood cells, you've got less mature ones, but you've also got less immature ones. So low reticular site, normocytic anemia. And we remember pH gas and Mr. Calm. So I'll go through the pH gas ones now, and Mr. Calm is kind of spread throughout the lecture. All right, so... These three big fancy names are the triad of things that I always get mixed up and forget. So first, there's paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin, hemoglobin urea. Um, and as the name suggests, it's so sudden peeing of blood at night. And it's pretty accurate. So in these patients, they have a mutation that causes increased red blood cell susceptibility to complement. Remember those protein factors that swim around the body, uh, swim around the blood, kind of labeling things for destruction or destroying things themselves when they're activated? Well, when we sleep, naturally, our breathing is shallowed. We develop a slight carbon dioxide retention and a slight uh, respiratory acidosis. 
and we get a slight activation of this complement pa uh, pathway cascade. And so in these patients with increased red blood susceptibility to complement, they get some lysis of their red blood cells at night. And so that's why they present with dark urine at night. And they also get these thromboses. I don't think, uh, I'm not sure if we fully understand why they get thromboses, but it's usually in the portal vein, and that's why they can get abdominal pain. So dark urine plus abdominal pain uh, at night, think PNH. What about hereditary spherocytosis? This is a red blood cell mutation causing spherical red blood cells rather than the normal biconcave discs. Uh, these spherical red blood cells, they, they still function completely normally. Their only issue is they can't uh, successfully navigate through the splenic sinusoids. And so they get gobbled up by the splenic macrophages. Uh, they get splenomegaly, jaundice, and there's a complete cure for it. Get rid of the spleen. Uh, if there's a question that has a patient with splenomegaly, jaundice, and spherocytosis, don't jump straight to hereditary spherocytosis as a cause. There's one other thing that it could be. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So uh, you've got to look at the rest of the question to determine which one it is. Uh, they'll probably say, like, uh, a direct Coombs test was performed, and if it's positive, then that's autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If it's negative, hereditary spherocytosis. Uh, and I'll go through that on the next slide. Um, but that's how you tell the difference. What about G6PD deficiency? As you guys probably know from doing buzzwords, uh, this is like buzzword heaven. So this is a mutation that causes increased red blood cell susceptibility to oxidative stress. So these are patients that get dark urine and back pain uh, in response to infections, sulfur drugs, and fava beans. Uh, and these oxi oxidative stresses cause the hemoglobin to precipitate as Heinz bodies, which are removed by splenic macrophages resulting in bite cells. These are all pure buzzwords. They're lovely. Uh, as for the back pain, where does the back pain come from? The back pain is due to kidney injury. Uh, and that's because with this sudden lysis of red blood cells, all that junk that's in the uh, red blood cells clogs the kidney and causes kidney injury. And icing on top, the patients are ethnic. So uh, another buzzword. S these are some blood films. Uh, spherical shaped red blood cells. These are spherocytes. We've got uh, these precipitated hemoglobins. Uh, these are uh, Heinz bodies for G6PD. And these red blood cells look like they've had bites taken out of them. These are bite cells for G6PD. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So this is the one I was talking about before. Uh, it's antibody-mediated red blood cell destruction. There are two types, depending on the antibody involved. So there's IgG mediated, and that's called warm, and there's IgM mediated, and that's called cold. Why are they called warm and cold? Uh, well, IgG mediated tends to bind to red blood cells in the relatively warm central body, whereas IgM tends to bind to red blood cells in the relatively cold extremities. And so they both have slightly different management strategies. So cold, they literally avoid cold temperatures, and you can use these chemotherapy drugs uh, if necessary. Uh, whereas warm, respond better to prednisolone, and if that doesn't work, splenectomy. Uh, pallor, jaundice, splenomegaly, very similar to hereditary spherocytosis. And you guys have probably heard of this hemolysis panel. Well, I made a mnemonic to help me remember it, and my mnemonic is CHERBAL. So it's direct Coombs, haptoglobin, unconjugated bilirubin, reticulocytes, blood film, and lactate dehydrogenase. What do all those mean? Direct Coombs test uh, looks at the red blood cell membranes and checks if there's uh, antibodies attached to them. So that will be positive in this one, negative in hereditary spherocytosis. Haptoglobin is a protein that uh, swims around the bloodstream. Uh, its sole purpose is to pick up free hemoglobins that pop out uh, to be recycled. And so 
if you've got hemolysis with lots of free hemoglobin being spewed out, then your haptoglobin are going to pick those up, and as a result, your free haptoglobin, which is what's measured here, will decrease. That's why haptoglobin is low in this condition. Unconjugated bilirubin is going to be high because all those hemes are recycled. Our first step in the recycling process, unconjugated bilirubin. Reticulocytes will be high. Blood film, just like this. And lactate dehydrogenase. Lactate is a measure of uh, tissue injury. It's released during tissue injury. And it's an, this is an autoimmune uh, destructive disease. We're going to get high lactate dehydrogenase. Yo. Just, just like this, just spherocytes. All right, so uh, direct Coombs is going to be low, and most of these others will be similar because this is a hemolytic condition. Uh, so haptoglobin will be low, and conjugated bilirubin will be high, and this it kind of depends if it's like an acute attack. Spherocytosis, if you've got, if they've had their spleen removed, like they're not going to be in any acute distress, like their body's going to be functioning normally. Uh, there's nothing else wrong with the red blood cells. Um, they're just misshapen. And so all these other values are probably going to be normal. Yeah. All right. Um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Um, this is the blood film. And as you can see, not only are there spherocytes, but there are also many other strangely shaped red blood cells. So that's classic of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Any other questions? Feel free to uh, yell them out if you feel. Uh, sickle cell anemia, uh, as you guys know from this blood film, we've got sickle shaped red blood cells uh, and they, they're not as functional so they can lead to anemia, but they can also clog our uh, vessels and that leads to your sickle cell crises and your microocclusions. And the etiology of these, uh, you probably know, this uh, autosomal recessive mutations causing gl gluteval substitutions, um, sub-Saharan Africa epidemiology. Um, it's classic. If you've got a sub-Saharan African patient, uh, consider sickle cell anemia as a cause. Uh, signs and symptoms. Um, so not only anemia, but also uh, you can get these mi painful microocclusive crises. Um, so like when jumping into cold water, you can get some vasoconstriction, and it increases the likelihood that these sickle-shaped red blood cells will occlude the vessels, so you can get pain like that. There's splenomegaly, and the body often destroys the spl its own spleen. That's called autosplenectomy. Um, and dactylitis in children, that's like fat sausage-shaped fingers in children. Sickle cell crises are when major vessels get obstructed, and like the pulmonary vessel. So you can get severe 10 out of 10 crushing chest pain radiating into the back and spine, fever, tachypnea. I think the management is what you guys really need to know. Uh, so splenectomy at a young age, if the spleen doesn't destroy itself. Uh, they require so vaccinations for encapsulated organisms like pneumococcus, meningococcus, and Hib. Those are three to remember. Um, the reason why you need vaccination against these is because uh, the memory B cells for these uh, are located in your spleen. So when you remove the spleen, you reduce your immunity to them. Uh, and you also need lifelong amoxicillin, which is protective against these. That's something worth knowing. And you can, uh, sickle cell often responds to hydroxyurea, which is a type of chemotherapy that increases your fetal hemoglobin which has uh, a less likelihood of sickling with low oxygen tension, which is pretty cool. And sickle cell crisis management, uh, ABCs, analgesics to treat that intense pain, and oxygen therapy, high flow oxygen therapy to increase oxygen tension, which reduces sickling, as well as blood transfusion. All right, this is the last thing I've tacked onto anemias. Uh, febrile neutropenia, as the name suggests, it's fever plus low neutrophils. In other words, it is an infection and no way to deal with it. So this is a medical emergency. Uh, as a result, uh, 
you jump straight onto tazacin as an empirical antibiotic. Uh, this is a dreaded complication of chemotherapy. Uh, and so often uh, chemo patients are strictly monitored for their neutrophil count. Um, and you can give them GCSF, that's granulocyte colony stimulating factor, to boost their neutrophil count. And the only reason why all chemo patients aren't just given GCSF uh, at the start is because it's so expensive. Um, and by the way, this word, nadir, it means projected trough. So they have either newts less than 0.5 or higher than 0.5 but with a projected trough of less than 0.5. Septic screen, you've probably heard. There are four components that are present. It's full blood count with differential, CRP, blood culture, and neuroanalysis with MCS. And you can also add on these other things, depending on uh, if you have any suspicions. Like, if, is your infection arising from the lungs? You can check the chest X-ray. Are you fearing that it could be in the uh, CSF, lumbar puncture? Uh, and quick quiz, what is this? Neutrophil. Uh, what about this one? This is also a neutrophil, uh, but it's slightly less mature. You can see it's not yet hypersegmented in its uh, in its nucleus. So this is what's called a band. What about this one? Lymphocyte. This one with all these dark granules scattered throughout the cell. You can't even see the nucleus. It's a basophil. What about this one? Two lobes to its nuclei and all these pink granules, eosinophil. And then this one, the biggest white blood cell, it's a monocyte. All right, so we've done the anemias and now we're on to the bleeding disorders. And I think we're making pretty good time. So we'll start with the easiest one, immune thrombocytopenia. This is low platelet count due to IgG antiplatelet antibodies. And this usually presents in young children often two weeks post-infection, and this is a really important one to know more for next year, but it, uh, it does come up in third year. And your only symptom is widespread petechiae, as you can see on this little bub here. And your lab finding is isolated thrombocytopenia. That's the only thing you see. So if you've got a patient, they've got bruising, and you look at the lab values, and all you see is low platelets, immune thrombocytopenia. As for management, in children, it's often conservative because uh, it can resolve by itself in weeks or months. They need to avoid NSAIDs because they can be antiplatelets and they need to avoid contact sports because they increase risk of bleeding. Uh, and then with the adults normally or with children who don't respond, uh, the stepwise therapy is PRED, IVIG, and then splenectomy, last line. All right? Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. This is where things start getting a little bit tricky. So these are three that you guys really need to know. Thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura, hemolytic uremic syndrome, and DIC. So what all these three have in common is that they produce microthrombi on small blood vessel walls that shear red blood cells as they attempt to go past. And this results in schistocytes, or as I like to think of them, shear schistocytes, because they get sheared. Also called... <laughs> Helmet cells. And this is, what, this is what they look like. These are schistocytes. They kind of look like helmets. Yep. So let's start with TTP. So in TTP, you get these microthrombi because of unusually large von Willebrand factor molecules that accumulate in endothelial cell walls and they trap platelets. And the reason you get this is because of a atom TS13 enzyme deficiency. Now, TTP presents with a tetra, uh, a pentad, um, and I've used the mnemonic, I made this one up, it's not very good, RAT-FN. And so there's renal failure, anemia, thrombocytopenia, purpura, fever, and neurologic dysfunction. And by neurologic dysfunction, this could be confusion, seizures, syncope. And TTP is a medical emergency. So you need to jump straight to plasma exchange and prednisolone if you have a high index of suspicion. You don't wait for the Adam TS13 enzyme assay to come back, straight to uh, plasma exchange. Hemolytic uremic syndrome 
actually presents really similarly, and you can actually use the same mnemonic. So it's a triad, and you use RAT, renal failure, anemia, thrombocytopenia. And so if you've got these symptoms, uh, and you've got no fever or neurologic dysfunction, think hemolytic uremic syndrome, and if you've attacked, if they're presented with a seizure, then you're thinking more TTP. So very similar. HUS is due to E. coli 0157H7, secreting a Shiga toxin, and it's usually preceded by diarrhea, because it's, uh, it's a, what is it, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, BHEC. As for DIC, you guys know this, it's, it's a widespread activation of the coagulation pathway, so you get simultaneous uh, clotting and bleeding. Um, most common cause is sepsis, and so they get hypotension, some renal failure, and also simultaneous bleeding, thrombosis, with low platelets, yet high PT and APTT. Does that make sense? And so I think that's a good segue into talking about coagulation cascade and inherited bleeding disorders. So the coagulation cascade, I think, is like mnemonic heaven. So let me show you what I mean. So let's do a bit of a recap. There is the intrinsic pathway, which has these four factors, and the extrinsic pathway, which has this one. They both come together at factor 10, the common pathway, 10, 5, 2, 1. All right? So firstly, intrinsic pathway dictates the APTT. And you remember that table tennis is played inside, right? Whereas extrinsic pathway dictates the PT. And you can remember that t tennis is played outside, all right? So these two come together, they're factors, to the common pathway, and it goes 10, 5, 2, 1. And these factors in mathematics are all factors of 10. 10, 5, 2, 1. Easy? All right. Extrinsic pathway, really easy to remember. It's just 7. That's all there is to it. 7 tissue factor, just remember 7. As for the intrinsic pathway, we've got 12, 11, 9, and 8. So, hey, you remember? So you start with 12. What's the last letter in the word 12? It's E. And so next one's 11. Last letter is N. So 9. Last letter is E. So 8. Last letter is T. 10. It's convoluted, but it works. And just like that, we know all the factors in the coagulation pathway. So if we're deficient in factor 8, this is haemophilia A, we're going to have a prolonged APTT and a normal PT. If we're deficient in factor 9, also a prolonged APTT and a normal PT. What if we're deficient in von Willebrand factor? Well, von Willebrand factor is actually involved in the survival. It's required for the survival of factor 8. So if we have von Willebrand disease, deficiency of von Willebrand factor, or abnormality, then you're going to have a deficiency of factor 8, and so you will have a prolonged APTT. So as we can see, these haemophilia and von Willebrand disease present pretty much the same in terms of laboratory values. So the way you distinguish between the two, or diagnostically, is to do factor assays. All right? Now, the symptoms are quite different. The bleeding pattern is quite different. So von Willebrand disease, what does von Willebrand factor do? It's involved in production of the, the primary clot, the platelet plug. Von Willebrand factor is involved in binding the platelets together to each other and to the endothelial cell wall. So you need it for the platelet plug. So if you don't have it, you'll get uh, prolonged bleeding when you, I don't know, start bleeding mucous membranes. Excessive prolonged superficial bleeding. So menorrhagia, GI bleeding, epistaxis. Whereas haemophilia is an issue with the secondary clot. It's an issue with this coagulation cas cascade with production of the fibrin mesh. And so you get, you get more of an excessive deep bleeding. So like hemarthroses and intracerebral bleeding. Also, because haemophilia is excellent recessive, if you've got a female, it's not going to be haemophilia. It's going to be von Willebrand disease. If you've got a male, then it's probably going to be haemophilia. All right? And now let's look at the other side of the spectrum. We've done bleeding. Let's do clotting, thrombophilia. 
So do you guys remember what protein S and protein C do? Protein S, all it does is activate protein C. That's easy. Protein C is involved in inhibiting factors 5 and 8 in order to control and regulate the coagulation pathway, coagulation cascade. And so if you had a mutant factor 5 that couldn't be inactivated by protein C, then the coagulation cascade would just run uncontrolled. You had an increased risk of clotting. And that's what factor 5 Leiden is. It's a mutant factor 5 that cannot be inactivated by protein C, leading to increased risk of venous clots. So classic question, uh, let's say you've got a 45-year-old woman who is presenting to ED with her third seemingly unprovoked DVT. You've got to do factor 5 Leiden, so uh, thrombophilia screen for factor 5. Uh, what you'll be testing for is activated protein C resistance, right? Antiphospholipid syndrome, it's another thrombophilia. And you've got this lupus anticoagulant that's causing increased propensity for clotting. And the name is actually a misnomer. So lupus anticoagulant is actually a prothrombotic uh, factor. And as you'll know, the buzzword, recurrent miscarriages. You've got to be looking at antiphospholipid. What about heparin-induced thrombocytopenia? This is one to keep in mind. So this is an autoimmune response against the normal heparin platelet factor 4 complex. So the classic case is a patient comes in with DVT. Uh, they're given low molecular weight heparin. Uh, they go home. They come back a week later. You check their platelets, and they've dropped suddenly from 300 all the way down to, like, 40. That's when you need to stop the heparin straight away because they're having hit and you need to give them vitamin K and a non-heparin anticoagulant such as apixaban, rivaroxaban. Make sense? Any questions? Cool. Alright, now we're getting to the good stuff. This is heme cancers and proliferative disorders. So this is the uh, cell production hierarchy, if you like. So we've got a hematopoietic stem cell, and we've got our lymphoid line, and we've got our myeloid line. Now, a lot of people struggle to tell the difference between ALL and CLL, and AML and CML. So let me just explain it now. AML is a cancerous mutation that occurs up here. So ALL, cancerous mutation that occurs up here at the lymphoid progenitor level. Whereas CLL, the mutation occurs down here, a bit further down the pathway, all right? AML is where the mutation occurs up here at the common myeloid progenitor level. And this is where it gets a bit tricky. Myeloproliferative neoplasms are when the mutation occurs down here. Myeloproliferative neoplasms, there's four. CML is an issue with this one, myeloblast. So you get excessive granulocytes, predominantly basophils. The other three, there's polycythemia rubrovira, excessive erythrocytes, and then there's a central thrombocytosis and primary myelofibrosis, and that's an issue here with the megakaryocytes. Those two are very similar conditions. So recap, ALL, CLL, AML, myeloproliferative neoplasms, CML, polycythemia rubrovira, a central thrombocytosis and primary myelofibrosis. All right? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so let's do ALL and CLL. So looking at the name, acute lymphoblastic leukemia versus a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The Ls don't stand for the same thing. Lymphoblasts are higher up in the hierarchy than lymphocytes, right? So one's problem with lymphoid progenitors, one's problem with not naive B cells. And so let's look at distinguishing characteristics because the signs and symptoms are quite similar for these leukemias. So ALL, kids, you guys know this, and then CLL, elderly. And CLL is really, really common. What other distinguishing characteristics? So we need to do a, bi a bone marrow biopsy. This stands for bone marrow, aspirate, and trephine. Aspirin is the, f aspirate is the fluid part that you get from the bone marrow biopsy. Trephine is more the solid part. Uh, 
And then, so you need to do a bone marrow biopsy for ALL, because you need to distinguish it between ALL and AML for chemotherapy purposes. Whereas for CLL, you don't have to do a bone marrow biopsy. This is so common, and it's not an emergency condition that you have to treat straight away. Usually you can wait years and years uh, for CLL. Uh, so a flow cytometry is all that is required for that to make the diagnosis. Um, chemotherapy is required for ALL, whereas it's not required immediately for CLL. And what else? Last thing, CLL will produce characteristic smudge or smear cells on blood film. This is what they look like. So these cells are so fragile that when you do the blood smear and you look at it under the microscope, they'll just be broken, they'll be smudged. All right, CLL. This is ALL and you can see all these big lymphoblasts scattered throughout the bone marrow. All right, let's do AML and CML. So uh, again, this is more uh, progenitor level, whereas this is a bit further down the hierarchy. Myeloid cells, predominantly granulocytes. All right, so let's look at distinguishing features. Uh, both present at the similar age group, so you can't really tell from that. Uh, AML have these characteristic myeloblasts with hour rods when you look at a blood, fear, blood film. So this is a myeloblast, and these are hour rods. So they're rods of myeloperoxidase, characteristic of myeloid cells in AML. Uh, what else? AML has this subtype called APML, acute promyelocytic leukemia. And that involves a retinoic acid receptor mutation that leads to the cancer. And if you've got a, if you've got a disruption in retinoic acid receptor, the treatment is retinoic acid. And you can also give arsenic. I have no idea why or how that works, but they do it and it works. Um, all right, distinguishing features of CML. So this is our 922 chromosome translocation producing a small 22, that's our Philadelphia chromosome. G'day. And we've got a BCR-able fusion gene. And this produces an overactive tyrosine kinase. How do you treat that? Tyrosine kinase inhibitor, imatinib. What else? CML is one of the three M's for massive splenomegaly. So we've got CML, bit of a cop-out, malaria, and myelofibrosis three M's of massive splenomegaly. What else? On the full blood count, we'll have high granulocytes, but basophils predominantly. Basophils are usually the least most prevalent uh, granulocyte or white, white cell, but here their levels increase a lot. Um, and that's what I think you need to know for those. So let's look at this blood film. These are two bone marrow biopsies from a patient with CML. So this is earlier stage and this is later stage. So as we can see here, remember how I said excessive granulocytes? So it's, uh, let's look at the granulocytes. So neutrophil, probably banned. Neutrophil, 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 neutrophil. The eosinophil maybe, basophil, basophil. Lots of granulocytes. Whereas on this one, it's become more basophilic granulocytosis. So we've got more basophils, all right? This is later stage CML. All right, let's do the lymphomas. So, common question, I've asked this many times, but I keep getting a different answer. What is the difference between lymphocytic leukemia and lymphoma? Now, the answer I often get, and I really don't like it, is that one occurs in blood and one occurs in lymph. And sure, that, that might be true, but it doesn't explain to me why uh, lymphocytic leukemias can give rise to lymphadenopathy. It doesn't explain that. So I think a better way to think of it is this word, lymphoma. The suffix oma means mass. So lymphomas are actually defined by their lymphadenopathy, whereas lymphocytic leukemias are not. You may or may not get lymphadenopathy with lymphocytic leukemias, but you definitely do in lymphomas. So what about the difference between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Why have they divided it up like that? Well, it's to do with 
how the lymphadenopathy is formed. So in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which you can think of as maybe the standard type of lymphoma, you get the lymphocytes themselves, the neoplastic lymphocytes, producing the lymphadenopathy. They come together and produce the mass. Whereas in Hodgkin's lymphoma, you get a special type of lymphocyte called a Reed Sternberg cell, and that secretes cytokines that draw other inflammatory cells together to form the lymphadenopathy. That's the difference. Different cells are producing this lymphadenopathy. So this is Hodgkin's lymphoma, and this is a Reed Sternberg cell. Kind of looks like owl's eyes. Uh, the lymphadenopathy in Hodgkin's lymphoma has this characteristic tenderness with alcohol consumption. Beautiful buzzword right there. There's a subtype called nodular sclerosing Hodgkin's, and that's where you get a special type of Reed Sternberg cell called a lacuna cell, and that's classically in young adult females that produces this young age group peak. What else do you need to know? You need to know the Ann Arbor staging. So this applies to non-Hodgkin's as well as Hodgkin's. The way I like to think of it is stage one, tumor at one lymph node on one side of the diaphragm, stage two, multiple lymph nodes on one side of the diaphragm, stage three, multiple lymph nodes on both sides of the diaphragm, and stage four, just diffusely spread. And then there's these other modifiers that just so happen to make the acronym ABSEX. Uh, we have A for no B symptoms, B for B symptoms, fever, weight loss, night sweats, S for spleen, E for extranodal, and then X for bulky disease. Yeah? All right, I feel like I can use this opportunity to talk about a lymph node. Uh, so we have, in the lymph node, there is a cortex, and that's where the B cells hang out. In the cortex, there's a follicle, surrounded by a mantle zone, surrounded by a marginal zone. Then we have the paracortex, where the T cells hang out. And then we have a medulla. So it's kind of like a kidney. It looks like a kidney, has a cortex and medulla, just like a kidney. Uh, except different entry and exit routes. So let me explain the magic. So lymph comes in here via the afferent lymphatic vessel, and there might be macrophages, dendritic cells carrying antigens, and they come to the cortex where the B cells are, and they present their antigens to the B cells. The B cells wake up, they come to the paracortex where the T cells are, they get stimulated by the T cells, and then they come to the medulla where they become either memory cells or plasma cells, they secrete their antibodies, and then the lymph comes off down this way, by, out the afferent. And that's how that all works. So now we can talk non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so there are many different subtypes, and some of the subtypes are based on where the B cells arise. So follicular lymphoma arises from the follicle, mantle cell arises from the mantle zone, marginal zone arises from the marginal zone, marginal zone lymphoma. Um, you might have heard of multoma. Uh, remember the malt tissue, uh, which is mucosal associated lymphoid tissue? Well, malt tissue only uh, arises when we have uh, a chronic inflammatory state, such as H. pylori gastritis, Hashimoto's, Sjogren's. And so mantle zone lymphoma has an increased risk of developing if you have Hashimoto's, Sjogren's, H. pylori gastritis. Uh, Burkitt lymphoma is an important one to know. Uh, there are some buzzwords to this that you can keep in mind. So C-MIC translocations cause B Burkitt's. It's associated with EBV. Starry sky appearance on histology. What else has a starry sky appearance on histology? Post-strep glomerulonephritis. And it presents as an extranodal mass in a child or young adult. So this extranodal mass can present in the jaw, that's the African type, or in the abdomen, that's the sporadic type. The most common type of non-Hodgkin's is DLBCL, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And for that, we treat with RCHOP therapy. RCHOP stands for rituximab, cyclophosphamide, hydroxydoxorubicin, we just use doxorubicin now, Oncovin, we use vincristine now, and prednisolone. So it's a pretty, uh, the mnemonic, or the RCHOP probably needs updating. 
Uh, but that's what it stands for. All right, that's lymphoma. Now for multiple myeloma. This is cancer of plasma cells producing excessive IgG and IgA. So there's a spectrum ranging from MGUS, so that's monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, and that has few abnormal plasma cells and it's asymptomatic, all the way to active myeloma with lots of abnormal plasma cells and symptomatic. Mean age of onset, elderly to 62, and we can use this mnemonic CRAB to remember the symptoms and features. So CRAB stands for calcium elevation, renal failure, anemia, and bone pain. And we can also extend that mnemonic CRAB to remember some of the other features of multiple myeloma. So high creatinine because of the renal failure, rule O formation. What is rule O formation? It is these red blood cells all sticking together like this. Amyloidosis. So what does that mean? Well, the immunoglobulin light chains can actually undergo a deforming conformational change and start depositing in tissues, and that's called amyloidosis. And we have Bentz-Jones proteins, which are the immunoglobulin light chains excreted in the urine. Let's look at the investigations. So bloods, we can almost diagnose this just like looking at the bloods. So what do we have? The A in crab, anemia. We've got the C in crab, calcium elevation. And we've got the R in crab, renal failure. Tack on bone pain anywhere in the body, and you've got to be thinking multiple myeloma. There's also a high ESR for chronic inflammation. This is a, so serum protein electrophoresis is an important one for multiple myeloma. And let me just explain what that is. So you guys remember what an electrophoresis is, going back to year 12, where the negatives and positive charges separating proteins. This is a normal one uh, of the blood. So this is the negative side, and this is the positive side. So albumin is the most prevalent protein, and it's the most negative. So it comes here. And then we've got this group of proteins, the alpha 1s, this one, the alpha 2s, we've got the betas. And then here, the last peak is the gamma peak. And this is where gamma globulin gets its name from. It's the gamma peak. Immunoglobulins come up here. And so this is a normal electrophoresis of serums, serum proteins. This is an abnormal one. As you can see, there are way too many gamma globulins here. And this is called an M spike, characteristic of multiple myeloma. We can do a skeletal survey with x-rays. So you'll have osteolytic lesions and pepper pot skull. Um, pepper pot skull is the lytic lesions in the skull. We need to do a bone marrow biopsy to differentiate multiple myeloma from MGUS, plasmacytoma, amyloidosis. Urine electrophoresis, that's where we get our Bentz-Jones protein, the immunoglobulin light chains, and our serum immunoglobulin levels. Remember that there's two light chains, kappa and lambda. If we've got a, a mutant uh, plasma cell, um, we've got clone of them, and they're all producing the one type of light chain, then this ratio is going to be massively skewed. It's a good giveaway of multiple myeloma. Waldenstrom's, oh yeah. question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, hemoglobin electrophoresis, it's probably different. Um, I don't know, maybe they separate the different hemoglobin out. Good question. All right. Waldenstrom's <coughs> macroglobulinemia. This is kind of a variant of multiple myeloma in that the mutant plasma cells produce IgM rather than IgG or IgA. IgM is this one, and IgMs tend to club together, thickening the blood. And so you get this symptoms of hyperviscosity symptom, like hyperviscosity syndrome, like visual blurring and headache. And this is very rare, but it's a differential to keep in mind. Systemic amyloidosis, we're getting close to the end of heme. Uh, this is deposition of amyloid proteins, so amyloid refers to any protein that has undergone a structural change increasing its beta sheet content. So it can be systemic or it can be organ specific. So examples of organ specific is like 
for A beta amyloid in Alzheimer's. So as for systemic, the most common one, primary amyloidosis, is with this uh, immunoglobulin light chain from multiple myeloma. So when you have multiple myeloma, you always need to do a bone marrow biopsy with Congo red stain under polarized light, and you get this apple green biorefringence just here. And another buzzword to know, we get pale and waxy appearance of organs, as you can see from these kidneys looking very pale and waxy. That's what you need to know for amyloidosis. And now, rounding at the cancers, the rest of the myeloproliferative neoplasms. So, quick recap, CML, polycythemia rubra vera, central thrombocytosis, and primary myelofibrosis. Now, uh, yeah, this one, excessive red blood cells. Essential thrombocytosis has excessive megakaryocytes, which tend to give rise to excessive platelets, whereas primary myelofibrosis, the deformed megakaryocytes tend to give rise to, or they tend to produce excessive platelet-derived growth factor, and that's why you get the marrow fibrosis. So in early stages of both of these conditions, they look very, very similar, hard to distinguish between them. So for these three, let's look for distinguishing characteristics so we can pick them out. So polycythemia rubra vera, uh, it's the most associated one with JAK2 mutation, 95% versus 50 and 50. You get this aquagenic pruritus, which is kind of unique. It's where a patient goes into the shower and then they develop uh, this intense itch from the water contacting their skin. And the reason why that is, is because not only do you have excessive red blood cells in polycythemia rubra vera, you also have excessive mast cells. So when the water touches the mast cells, they produce the histamine and you get that intense itch. And you also have, so all these red blood cells, you have a higher hematocrit, thicker blood, and so you have an increased tendency for thrombosis, clotting. So you get increased risk of clots everywhere. DVT, stroke, hepatic vein, but Chiari. What else? We have a low erythropoietin. The body's like, please stop making these red blood cells. Um, the cancer's just like, no way. And the management, phlebotomy. Just pull out the blood. Essential thrombocytosis, what do you need to know? All you need to know, excessive Platelets. And by excessive, I mean greater than 1,000, where, what, 400, 450 is the cutoff. And management, antiplatelets, so aspirin, clopidogrel. What about primary myelofibrosis? What do you need to know? It's one of the causes of massive splenomegaly. We get these teardrop red blood cells on the blood film, and that's because the marrow is so fibrosed that it starts crying. No, it, the red blood cells struggle to get out of the bone marrow, and they deform themselves in the, way, in the, in the meantime. Uh, and when you do a bone marrow biopsy, it's so fibrosed that you can't get any fluid out. It's called a dry tap. Characteristic features of myelofibrosis. All right. Uh, and the last section in heme, heme failure disorders, and we've almost done all of heme, uh, these two, aplastic anemia and myelodysplastic syndrome. What is the difference between these two? So aplastic anemia, as you probably know, complete bone marrow failure. So we've got pancytopenia, low everything, and marrow hypocellularity. What about myelodysplastic syndrome? Now, some of you might think, wasn't myelodysplastic syndrome previously actually called a pre-leukemia? Isn't it very similar to AML, which is kind of on the other side of the spectrum, excessive blood cells? I'm sure you're all thinking that, right? Well. The difference with myelodysplastic syndrome is that these cancerous cells are actually at, have a greater propensity to just undergo apoptosis as soon as they leave the bone marrow. So you may get excessive cells in the bone marrow, but then they just die as soon as they leave. That's the distinguishing characteristic of myelodysplastic syndrome. And so you get this hypercellular marrow, but pancytopenia. And so as a result, you, they both get uh, increased infections. So SPUR stands for, uh, what is it? I forgot. Um, prolonged, unique, recurrent, severe, prolonged, unique, recurrent infections. SPUR infections. 
Uh, and the last thing I think you need to know about these uh, comes under aplastic anemia, its cause. Drug toxicity can be a cause of aplastic anemia, as well as congenital. So that includes drugs like benzene and carbamazepine. All right? And that's all I think you need to know about those two. Now, what do you think? Should we go through some quiz questions or take a break? Yeah, let's do them. All right, I got one nod. I'm happy with that. All right. What's this? Hi, yep. So, yeah, think it to yourself, mumble to a friend. Uh, let's go through them. Yep, Heinz bodies. Uh, what about this? Teardrop blood cells, basophilic stippling, there's also target cells, there's thalassemia. Spherocytes, hereditary spherocytosis could also be autoimmune hemolytic anemia. This one, hyper lobulated neutrophil, hypersegmented uh, folate B12. What about these? Red blood cells with bites taken out of them. Bite cells. This one, red blood cells that look like they've just smashed into something. Schistocytes or helmet cells. What about this one? These are ringed cytoblasts from cytoblastic anemia. And what about this one? We have these very pale looking red blood cells, iron deficiency anemia. And some more. Easy, read Sternberg cell. Smudge cells, CLL. What about these ones? Lots of lymphoblasts in the bone marrow, ALL. Hour rods for AML. What about this one? Lots of granulocytes in the bone marrow. This one has lots of basophils. CML. Red blood cells all sticking together. Rouleau. What about these ones? Sickle cell red blood cells. And we've got some targets here, some tears here. Thalassemia. All right, and I've got some questions. This is blood smear. Bone marrow, bone marrow, bone marrow, I think. Yeah. Hard to tell. All right, heme questions. So let's go through these, I have five. So we've got a 66 year old construction worker has pain in his right arm to which he initially attributed to muscular strain but has slowly worsened over three months. He also has back pain. Vitals are normal, everything's normal, mucous membranes are pale. Looking at the investigations, low hemoglobin, so anemia, normocytic, high calcium, high creatinine. What is the condition? We have, we have crab here. We have high calcium, renal failure, anemia, and he has bone pain, back pain, bone pain, multiple myeloma. All right, second question. 30-year-old woman presents to ED due to seizures and confusion. She has a fever, bruises on her arm, which her husband believes are injuries due to the seizure, very pale, no past medical history, creatinine is high, and blood film shows helmet-shaped cells. What are helmet-shaped cells? Schistocytes which means you've got one of those mahas, the microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. So let's see if we have a rat here. We have high creatinine, so we've got renal failure. It's very pale, anemia. She has some bruises, thrombocytopenia. She also has fever, and she's presented with seizure, neurological issue. So this is TTP. How would you treat her? Straight away, how would you treat her? Plasma exchange and prednisolone. Yeah. Question three. So, 70 year old woman presents to a GP for a routine visit. She has a past history of gastric cancer treated with gastrectomy. She appears pale and has recently developed a tingling sensation in her fingers and toes. B12 deficiency. Yep. All right. 
22-year-old girl presents the GP for a follow-up appointment. Two months ago, she was found to have a mild anemia and has since been taking iron tablets daily. She has no other symptoms. Her family emigrated from Turkey when she was young. Her investigation showed that her anemia has only slightly improved. What is the best investigation to make the diagnosis? Hemoglobin electrophoresis. I answered that question before. And last one. 66-year-old woman, fatigue, painless lymphadenopathy, blood film shows smudge cells. So we know straight away this is CLL, but what do we do to, to make the diagnosis? Do we do a bone marrow biopsy or do we do a flow cytometry? Flow cytometry for this one. Yeah. All right, now we're on to endocrinology. How about we have a five-minute break, bathroom break, and then start again? Good idea? All right, let's do it.
All right, ready to restart Endo? Okay, let's get started. Um, so, like with Heme, we can break it up into subgroups. So we have pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, adrenals, pancreas, electrolytes. So let's get started, starting with pituitary. And I can do some recap of second year along the way, uh, mostly for my benefit. Um, so, hormones of the pituitary. Uh, we've got, from the anterior lobe, we have our ACTH, we have TSH, we have these gonadotropins, prolactin, growth hormone, and then posterior lobe, ADH, and oxytocin. And these are the conditions that we're going to go through. So starting with hypopituitarism. This is probably the most confusing one out of the whole endocrine because there are so many components to it. So it's decreased production of one or more pituitary hormones. So there's a couple of different types of presentation with hypopituitarism. So uh, the first one that I can say is pan hypopituitarism, so decreased everything. And some of the causes of that are, so pituitary apoplexy, so the patient has excruciating headache, visual disturbance, ophthalmoplegia, and that's because they had an adenoma that has suddenly ruptured and it's just spewed blood all over the pituitary and has just killed off the whole pituitary. Uh, you've also got Sheen's syndrome, which is a big one for next year. Uh, so patient gives birth and then suddenly they lose a lot of blood and the pituitary is just starved of blood right there. So pituitary has a separate blood system. Uh, and that can cause pan hyperpituitarism. And there's also hemochromatosis. So just iron completely saturates the pituitary, killing off everything. So in this condition, uh, we'll lose so everything, uh, particularly ACTH. And that gives kind of a central Addison's because the whole cortex isn't working properly. The only thing that is working properly is aldosterone. So we have normal aldosterone, normal blood pressure in uh, pan hyperpituitarism because the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is ACTH independent. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system is ACTH independent. We also have a central, oh, a central hypothyroidism because we've lost our TSH and we have, uh, we have lost our gonadotropins and we've lost our prolactin and so we'll get those respective symptoms. You can also have a pituitary adenoma that enlarges and compresses only like the surrounding structures. So you can lose just one or two hormones. Uh, yeah, so um, common pituitary adenomas, I'll get to probably next slide, or the slide after, is acromegaly and prolactinoma. Those are two big ones, and they can compress surrounding uh, hormone producing structures. Investigations are just our hormone investigations and then we want to do a pituitary MRI to have a look. All right, let's do diabetes insipidus. So what is diabetes? In Latin, diabetes means to siphon or uh, to flow through. So in diabetes, you get increased drinking, uh, polydipsia, and increased urination, polydipsia. So what's the difference between diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus? Mellitus, uh, in Latin, means sugary, or like honey-flavoured, uh, for the urine, whereas insipidus means bland, lack of taste of the urine. So diabetes insipidus is kind of just watery urine, urine uh, whereas mellitus is sugary urine. So this is because the renals have lost their ability to concentrate the urine. Watery urine, they've lost the ability to concentrate. They have ADHD deficiency. ADH deficiency. <laughs> I screwed up that pun. Damn. <laughs> All right, so it can be central or nephrogenic. So in central, you have ADH deficiency. You've lost the hormone that's supposed to concentrate urine. Whereas nephrogenic, you have ADH resistant. The hormone still works and it's produced, but it just or it doesn't work. It doesn't work on the kidneys. It's too resistant. So central uh, common causes, head trauma, pituitary surgery, craniopharyngioma. 
and the nephrogenic uh, common cause is a side effect of lithium for bipolar disorder. Signs and symptoms, polyuria and polydipsia, and then investigations, you'd want to do blood glucose level to make sure it's not mellitus. UEC, we have high sodium because we're just urinating all our water out, so we'll have a very concentrated or high sodium bloodstream, we're dehydrated. And now, to tell the difference, whether it's central or nephrogenic, or if it's even di diabetes insipidus in the first place, we want to do water deprivation test and desmopressin stimulation test. I used to get really confused with these two. Uh, so normally, urine osmolality is about 500 to 800 milliosmoles per kilo. And if you starve yourself of water, the urine will become more concentrated, yeah? So this number will increase, 800. And so starving yourself of water, that's water deprivation test. And so if you have psychogenic polydipsia, which is you just habitually drink more and more water, then you're going to have a normal response. You starve them of water, their urine osmolality goes up. In diabetes insipidus, you can't activate that ADH. So even if you starve some of water, uh, their uh, urine osmolality will still be low. So water deprivation is how we work out if it's diabetes insipidus or if it's something else. So now we've done that, now we know it's diabetes insipidus, and now we want to figure out which one it is. Is it central or nephrogenic? That's where we do a desmopressin stimulation test. So this is where we give the person desmopressin, which is like synthetic uh, ADH. If they have central, which they normally have ADH deficiency, if you give them ADH, you're fixing the problem. So their, uh, their urine osmolality will improve. Uh, it will return to normal. Whereas if you have nephrogenic, even if you give them ADH, it'll still do nothing because they've got ADH resistance. And so there's little or no change in nephrogenic. And then you can cater the management to what type it is. So if they've got central, desmopressin fixes the problem. So they can treat it like that. Whereas nephrogenic, treat underlying cause. For example, if it's a lithium side effect, maybe change the dose, change the drug. Or uh, the sodium restriction, drink lots of water, and thiazides can help with that as well. All right, pituitary tumors. So two big ones to know, acromegaly and prolactinoma. Acromegaly is excessive growth hormone production, and that can be before the epiphyseal plates close, it's gigantism, or afterwards, that's acromegaly. Uh, it's usually due to a pituitary somatotroph adenoma, 99% of the time. 1% of the time, it's a neuroendocrine growth hormone, releasing hormone secreting tumor. That's usually gastrointestinal tract, um, very uncommon. You guys know the signs and symptoms. Facial feature coarsening, macroglossia, jaw nose enlargement, frontal bossing, large hands and feet. You know you need a different hat size, classic things. Um, as for investigations, so do we want to check their growth hormone level? No, because growth hormone level fluctuates throughout the day. So we actually go one step down line and we check their serum IGF level, the insulin-like growth factor one, which is increased from growth hormone. So that's a more reliable test, serum IGF one. Then we can do an oral glucose suppression tests to confirm that this is excess GH, acromegaly. And normally, you give someone glucose, their growth hormone production will decrease. But in this person, uh, with acromegaly, it won't. Poor growth hormone suppression. And then pituitary MRI. Reason for the pituitary MRI, we want to see how big it is, where exactly it's located, so we can do a trans surgery. We go through the nose and get out the tumor. Uh, really important to remember the complication. So the main complication, the reason why they die, is cardiomyopathy. This is the reason why we need to treat them, because they'll die from cardiomyopathy. And diabetes mellitus is another uh, complication of acromegaly. Um, one thing else that I wanted to, I didn't know where to include this, about performance enhancing drugs, I said I would. So um, if you've got a patient, uh, this is a common question, let's say the patient uh, in a question has, uh, is an athlete. They're an athlete, or they're a bodybuilder, or they're a weightlifter, or even like a cyclist. Uh, if it specifically says that they 
a fit in any way, then they're on some illegal drug, all right? So if they're a weightlifter, bodybuilder, they're on steroids, definitely, and they have some steroid side effect. Maybe they have high LDL cholesterol, low HDL cholesterol, um, they're definitely on steroids. Whereas, I don't know, other common ones, um, someone taking thyroxin, who's an athlete, um, someone taking growth hormone, um, and then another one, uh, let's, say, let's say you have 25 year old female who works in a pharmacy and she's trying to lose weight but can't lose weight. She's on either insulin or thyroxin, all right? Some tricky ones. So prolactinoma, excess prolactin, and this is due to pituitary adenoma. Um, signs and symptoms, if it's in a female, you get amenorrhea, galactorrhea, and then for male, loss of libido, erectile dysfunction, and then, you know this one, biotemporal hemianopsia, loss of your temporal visual fields, um, classic for prolactinoma, and then investigations, serum prolactin, pituitary MRI, computerized visual fields, and as for management, there are two ways to go, medical, surgical. So you can go dopamine agonists like bromocryptine. So this is more if it's you know, a tiny uh, pituitary adenoma. Um, they've got no symptoms. You've just found a high prolactin on some routine bloods. Um, then you can do bromocryptine. Uh, but if they have severe symptoms, then you'll need to do surgery. All right? All right, that's, that's that. So thyroid, parathyroid. So slight recap, thyroid gland produces thyroid hormone, calcitonin from parafollicular C cells, and it is stimulated by TSH from the pituitary gland. So let's, do, let's compare hypothyroid and hypothyroid. I don't need to go over this much at all because I'm confident that everyone here can tell if someone has hyper or hypothyroidism. Hyper, you know, weight loss, increased appetite, heat intolerance, amenorrhea, hypo, weight gain, increased appetite, cold intolerance, menorrhagia. One thing that's specific that's important to know is the Graves only symptoms. So if someone has exophthalmus or pretibial myxedema and your options in EMQ are hypothyroidism or Graves, hypothyroidism will be wrong. You can't, you can't do that. It, you can't leave it open to all those different options of hypothyroidism. You've got to choose Graves because these are Graves specific features. And that's because fibroblasts behind the eyes and shins have TSH receptors. So this is specific to Graves because Graves has anti-TSH autoantibodies that triggers these receptors and increases secretion of glycosaminoglycans in this area. Yeah? All right. So let's do hyperthyroidism. So this is hyperthyroidism is thyroid hyperfunction, thyroid overactivity. Thyroid toxicosis is excess thyroid hormone, excess T3 or T4. Hypothyroidism does not always equal thyroid toxicosis. It usually does. So if you have an overactive thyroid, you're usually going to produce more uh, thyroxin, more thyroid hormone. But you can get excessive thyroid hormone due to other things, like, for example, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is a cause of hypothyroidism. So in Hashis, you get destruction of the thyroid, so those destroyed uh, thyroid cells spew out their thyroid hormone and uh, hence you get thyroid toxicosis from Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It's a transient, it's called Hashi toxicosis. Um, causes of hyperthyroidism, so the three big ones, Graves, which you know, type 5 hypersensitivity reaction, the anti-TSH autoantibodies stimulate the TSH receptors. And then you have toxic multinodular goiter, producing multiple hyperfunctioning uh, thyroid nodules, and toxic adenoma, which is a single hyperfunctional thyroid nodule. Risk factors, young females for graves, family history, smoking, can, uh, it can trigger thyroid eye disease uh, specifically, and complication, thyroid storm. So remember this, uh, severe fever, severe tachycardia, extreme restlessness. Now, investigations, it's kind of like a triad of investigations to remember. First thing, thyroid function tests. So TSH and T4, T3, T4. So 
it will be low in hypothyroidism. And all you really need to do to check whether it's hyper or hypo is the TSH. It will be low in hyper and high in hypo. So OSCE situation, when your brain doesn't work at all, just look at TSH, whether it's hyper or hypo. Thyroid autoantibodies. So in Graves, you'll have anti-TSH receptor antibodies. And in Hashis, you'll have anti-TPO, so thyroid peroxidase, or anti-thyroglobulin autoantibodies. And the third thing in the trial of investigations, radioactive iodine uptake scan. So this will really distinguish the three of the hypothyroidisms. Graves will have diffuse uptake. Toxic, mul toxic multinodular goiter will have multiple localized regions of uptake. And then toxic adenoma has single localized region of uptake. All right? Now for management, first line is ionamides, carbimazole and propothyroidal And the reason why you need to do that first is because to do these other two, the curative ones, thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine, you need to be in a euthyroid state. So you start with thionamides. And then as for these two, which one you choose, it's, it's really patient choice if there's no other contraindications. So you can't do radioactive iodine, say, if they have severe eye disease, and that's because in the initial stages of radioactive iodine treatment, it'll exacerbate your eye disease before solving the problem. Uh, or pregnancy, you'll deform the child. Uh, and in thyroidectomy, um, you can administer this Lugol solution, which is iodine and potassium iodide, which seems a little counterintuitive. Why are you giving iodine to a patient with hyperthyroidism? And you're kind of, what's happening is, it's called a wolf shikoff block. You're like oversaturating the thyroid with iodine, which actually reduces the thyroid function, kind of just stops it from working uh, short term. So it only lasts, I think, weeks. Um, yeah. And then management of thyroid storm, high dose protothyroid beta blockers, very symptomatic, and then corticosteroids, those three. All right, hypothyroidism. This is thyroid underactivity, leading to low T3 and T4. Two big ones to know are Hashis and subacute thyroiditis. So Hashis is autoimmune thyroid destruction by anti-TPO or anti-thyroglobulin antibodies. And this produces a transient thyrotoxicosis initially before you get hypothyroidism, all right? Um, as for subacute de Quervain's thyroiditis, this is a post-viral thyroid inflammation and it presents as a tender enlarged thyroid. So this is the only one that has a tender enlarged thyroid. These other ones, so Rydal fibrosing thyroiditis, this is uh, less important. It's extensive thyroid fibrosis with a hard as wood, non tender thyroid, classically in a young female. And then euthyroid 6 syndrome, it's also called low T3 syndrome. So when you're acutely sick, so you have an active illness, you get decreased peripheral deiodination of T4. And so it just presents with an isolated low T3 with normal T4 and TSH. All right? One to exclude for differentials. Um, all right, investigations, um, th thyroid function tests, jump straight to the TSH. We see it's high, it's hypothyroidism. Um, and remember that in hypothyroidism, T4 isn't always low. Initial stages, say hashies, it's going to be high, hashi toxicosis. As for management, hashies, you start with a uh, thionamide, propothyroidal. And then you follow that by thyroxin. Then for dequervanes, you can just do NSAIDs and it will resolve by itself. Rydal's corticosteroids. All right, thyroid cancer. So uh, let's jump straight to carcinomas because that's where the exam important stuff is. Thyroid adenomas are more common. Um, so keep those in mind. But carcinoma, there are four types of thyroid carcinoma. And you can remember it using the mnemonic, the mnemonic, please feed my alligator. Papillary, follicular, medullary, and anaplastic. And this mnemonic works really well because the order of those four are in order of worsening prognosis, increasing age, and decreasing incidence. All right? So papillary, most common, youngest patient. Uh, so you get this painless, palpable, solitary nodule in a young female. 
classically. Uh, what are the first two letters of papillary? It's somoma bodies for P and anti-nuclei, often anti-nuclei for A. That's how I remember. Pretty shit mnemonic, but works. Uh, often anti-nuclei. This is what they look like, which I think is really creepy. <laughs> Follicular. Uh, neoplasia of follicles uh, with the tumour invading through the capsule. Uh, medullary. That's another important one to remember with papillary. These are the two most important. This is a neoplasia of parafollicular C cells leading to high calcitonin and hypocalcemia with localised amyloidosis in the tumour. Remember this. Remember the localised amyloidosis in the tumour. If you have, if you spot someone with medullary thyroid cancer, there's one test that you have to do. It's a plasma metanephrine level. Why on earth do you have to do a plasma metanephrine level? plasma methanethylene level if you spot medullary thyroid cancer because they may have a comorbid pheochromocytoma. They may have medullary thyroid cancer as a syndrome called MEN syndrome, multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome. And I have a slide on that later when we get to pheochromocytoma. If you do a thyroidectomy to treat a patient with medullary thyroid cancer, and they actually have a hidden pheochromocytoma, you, you may very well kill them because you do not want to perform surgery on a patient with a pheochromocytoma. So I'll repeat, if you spot medullary thyroid cancer, you've got to do a plasma metanephrine level to rule out pheochromocytoma. Last one, anaplastic. This is the most severe, older patient, and it's highly malignant, and it invades locally to airways. A for airways, anaplastic is airways. Investigation, TFTs, thyroid ultrasound, radioactive iodine scan, and this is the most important, our fine needle aspirate to tell which one it is, if it's benign, malignant, and which type. Management, thyroidectomy, and complications. These are really important to know. So thyroidectomy complications. This could be important for an OSCE explanation station. Bleeding, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, and hypoparathyroidism. And that presents for um, EMQ style uh, perioral tingling, which is tingling around the mouth uh, due to hypocalcemia. Post surgical hematoma is another complication that you really need to remember. So if you have any suspicion of this, so a patient has just had thyroid surgery, they're at the bedside, I don't know, they're suddenly deteriorating, um, swelling in their neck. Uh, you immediately don't do any tests, immediately open the sutures. Any suspicion, open the sutures, all right? Because if, they've, if that swells up, it can compress the tracheal veins and they can die. So I think, uh, I believe all patients who get a thyroidectomy, they just have a suture kit right next to their bed in case this happens. You need to do it straight away. No taking chances. Parathyroid, so... Uh, hyperparathyroidism. So I have a great mnemonic, which isn't really great, I think it is, for calcium uh, metabolism or calcium regulation. Um, I talked to you guys last year. Um, I'm going to say it again. So um, three calcium regulating hormones. Which ones make calcium go high and which ones make calcium go low? Parathyroid hormone and calcitriol have the sound I in them. And so they make blood calcium go high, whereas calcitonin has the sound O, and it makes blood calcium go low. All right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Most common cause, parathyroid adenoma. Investigations, easy, high calcium, high parathyroid hormone, and management. Only do a parathyroidectomy if they're symptomatic. All right? So symptomatic hypercalcemia, What's that? Bones, stones, groans, moans, psychiatric overtones, or if they have complications, say renal stones. Easy. All right, let's do adrenals. Okay, so these are these little party hats on top of the kidneys. Let's go through the layers. Remember, go find Rex, make good sex. That's how I remember. We have aldosterone cortisol, and in the androgens, 
dihydroepiandosterone. Not testosterone, dihydroepiandosterone. The reason why you should remember this is because, let's say has a, a patient has signs of hyperandrogenism, and you're suspecting uh, that they've got a tumour. So this tumour could be in the adrenals, or it could be in the gonads, so testes or ovary. How you tell which one it is, is you test for dihydroepiandosterone and testosterone. If they have high dihydroepiandosterone, it's adrenal tumour. And if they have high testosterone, it's called a Leydig cell tumour. It's ovarian or uh, testes tumour, a Leydig cell tumour. All right, so let's go through these conditions. We've got Cushing's, and I'm sure you guys have been quizzed a million times by clinicians about the symptoms of Cushing syndrome. I've been quizzed many, many times. Uh, so Cushingoid is my go-to. Cataracts, ulcers, skin symptoms, hypertension, infection, necrosis of hip, glycosuria, osteoporosis, obesity, muscle atrophy, immunosuppression, diabetes. Um, there's also these other features which don't fit in the mnemonic, like buffalo hump and moon face, um, and facial plethora, plethora. So what is Cushing syndrome? It's defined as high cortisol. That's Cushing syndrome. And there are four things that can give you a high cortisol. They are ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma. This is Cushing's disease. There is an ectopic ACTH secreting tumour, most common cause, small cell lung cancer, adrenal adenoma, and exogenous glucocorticoids, so taking too much PrEP. So how do you tell which one it is? There's a stepwise uh, order of investigations that you do. First, you do a cortisol test. Easiest one, late night salivary cortisol. And so if the cortisol is high, then it's one of these three. So we, whoops, one of these three. So we exclude exogenous glucocorticoids because they're too much PRED, so they'll, their whole axis will be uh, decreased. So low cortisol, low ACTH. So then we can get rid of that one. Second test is actually to choose a different one of these and confirm your result. Next test is plasma ACTH level. If it's high, then it's one of these two. If it's low, then it's adrenal adenoma. All right? Last test is high-dose dexamethadone suppression test. And this test is to distinguish which one of it it is. So ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma will be suppressed by 8 milligram DST, whereas an ectopic tumour small cell lung cancer, will not be suppressed. And that's how you tell. And then you can confirm that with a pituitary MRI or adrenal CT, if you're thinking adrenal adenoma. And that's what you need to know. Hyperaldosteronism. So this is excess aldosterone. What does aldosterone do? Well, it draws in sodium in the renal tubules and it excretes potassium. So uh, if you've got too much sodium, hypertension. If you've got too low potassium, that's hypokalemia. And remember that potassium and hydrogen come hand in hand. High potassium leads to high hydrogen, low potassium, low hydrogen. So we've got hypokalemia, so we'll get low hydrogen metabolic alkalosis. This is our triad for hyperaldosteronism. Now, remember, there are two conditions that cause hyperaldosteronism. One is adrenal adenoma, and that's called Kohn's syndrome, producing excessive aldosterone. Second one is renal artery stenosis. What happens here is it's usually caused by atherosclerosis of the renal artery. And if you get, so you get narrowing of the renal artery, so uh, the renal, the kidneys are the ones that produce the aldosterone. And so the, so narrowing of the renal artery, the kidneys get less perfused, and as a result, the kidneys think, shit, the body's losing blood. Blood pressure is going down in the body. I need to produce more aldosterone to fix this. And so it does. 
it produces more renin, which activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So more renin and more aldosterone. And so to distinguish between which one it is, you need to check the aldosterone and you need to check the renin. So adrenal adenoma will have high aldosterone and low renin, negative feedback, whereas renin, renal artery stenosis will have high both, high renin and high aldosterone. Yeah? Signs and symptoms are similar for both, hypertension, polyuria, irritability, anxiety. Management, aldosterone antagonist like spironolactone and or adrenalectomy. So our investigations, we know potassium is low, uh, ABG or VBG for metabolic alkalosis, and we need to do this aldosterone-renin ratio to determine if it's cons or if it's renal artery stenosis. Uh, now, now that we've figured out which one it is, let's say it's adrenal adenoma. Now we need to figure out, is it unilateral or is it bilateral? And to do this, we can do a CT, and that should detect which one it is, unilateral or bilateral. But if not, we have a backup, and that's adrenal venous sampling. All right? Uh, now, this is the mnemonic. I really, really like this mnemonic. I've used it many times to tell the secondary causes of hypertension. So if it's not primary hypertension, it's going to be one of these. CHAPS, Cushing's, hyperaldosteronism, aortic coarctation, pheochromocytoma, and renal artery stenosis. All right? So someone with... Uh, hypertension that's refractory to medication, go through these and see which symptoms line up with which uh, condition. All right? What about Addison's disease? So this is kind of like, kind of presents the opposite to hyperaldosteronism. We've got adrenal cortex destruction causing decreased all of the cortical hormones, cortisol, aldosterone, and dihydroepiandosterone. Most commonly, it's autoimmune destruction of the cortex, but developing countries, tuberculosis. Um, and this is an important one to remember, Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. This is uh, hemorrhage of the adrenals and destruction because of meningococcal septicemia. All right? Um, investigations, we've got the opposite to hyperaldosteronism. We have, because we've lost our aldosterone, we have low sodium causes a low blood pressure, and high potassium. We also have low cortisol, high ACTH. There's nothing wrong with the pituitary, so we've got a high ACTH, trying to get that cortisol up, but nothing's happening. And uh, diagnostic test of choice, it's what's called a synacthin test, uh, ACTH simulation test. Synacthin is uh, it's artificial ACTH, and uh, you give them that, and it does nothing because our adrenals don't work. Now, signs and symptoms. Uh, I like to remember the Ds. And you remember Nadita from first and second years? Uh, she told me these ones. So the Ds of Addison's disease. Decreased blood pressure, decreased weight, depression, and dark skin. The dark skin is a bit of physiology. So hyperpigmentation because you get increased ACTH, trying to ramp that cortisol up, and ACTH and melanocyte stimulating hormone are both derived from POMC, higher up in the hypothalamus. You guys probably know that. Management, adrenal crisis, uh, do your ABCs, uh, IV hydrocortisone, which is a cortisol, and IV dextrose. You can possibly give a mineralocorticoid, but it's actually not that uh, important. As for long-term, replacement of glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. In men, you don't often need to replace the androgens because the testes can produce a lot of that. Um, whereas in women with decreased libido, you can give androgens. And last one for adrenals, pheochromocytoma. This is a tumour of adrenal medulla producing excess catecholamines, adrenaline. I like to call this condition pheochromocytoma because I really like a, dis uh, a disease named after me, pheochromocytoma. All right, so etiology, it's usually sporadic, but 35% can be due to some kind of syndrome. And this is where the men's syndromes come into play. Some of you may have heard of this, but I don't think I was taught this at Monash last year, um, but it's important to keep in mind. Um, so there's three. There's men one, men two A, 
and meant to be. Why they didn't go one, two, three is beyond me. Um, so these are really, really hard to memorize. So the best I've found is three Ps, two Ps and one M, one P and two Ms. So pituitary, parathyroid, pancreatic, and then there's theocrosome, uh, theo, parathyroid, medullary thyroid, and then there's theo, medullary thyroid, and mucosal neuroma slash marfanoid habitus. All right? MEN 2A and 2B are the ones that have theo and medullary thyroid together. Now, signs and symptoms. I made up this mnemonic, uh, and it works. Theo chromosotoma. So P stands for palpitations, H for headaches, A for anxiety panic attacks, and E for excessive sweating. So there's some other differentials here. So before you jump to theochromosotoma, consider hyperthyroidism and panic attacks because theochromosotoma is actually really uncommon. 